I'll I think be... you'll find one sure enough. Okay. <laughs> okay. <All laughs> so right. my first question is, what's the bottom line of the take home message from your talk on that passage from John? So my bottom line was just to understand that the spiritual life is metaphor. So using that passage from John, I would use the metaphor of our weekly Eucharist as a symbol for what's happening. So when we have the Eucharist, we take the bread and the wine, we give thanks to God for them, and then we elevate the bread and the wine. And so there's this invitation to take the literal parts of our lives, the finite and physical reality, and elevate it to the infinite reality, to the, to the metaphorical level. That's not making sense. <laughs> so let's just speak about it in plain language. So it's a movement from the finite to the infinite, from the practical to the, the symbol. So every week we take bread and wine, and we say to the bread and wine, you are the body of Christ. And the bread and wine goes, sure, no problem. I'll be the body and blood of Christ. And so we go on. But the point of that is that it's not an empty ritual. It's to train our consciousness so that we see ourselves as the body and blood of Christ and that we see everything we do as Eucharist. So it's a transformation of every aspect of our lives into Eucharist living. So the bread and wine just accept that they're the body and blood of Christ because the church led by the priest says, you are the body of Christ. And in some ways we invited to enter into the simplicity of the bread and wine and go, okay, I'll be the body and blood of Christ and I'll live my life as Eucharist. So for example, St. Augustine used to give communion to his congregation and they had to say, he would give them the bread or the wine and he'd say the body of Christ and they would receive the body and blood of Christ and say, yes, I am. Does, does that make sense? Uh, it's, it's clearer. Yeah, so yeah. Every, every, from the moment you wake up, even before you wake up, everything is Eucharist. Well, that, that's my last question. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so you, you're living your life in... You're living your life as Eucharist. Well, you've half answered the next question, where, as I said, I get the drift of what a metaphor is. Yes. It was helped by the beginning of the sermon. The, the beginning of the sermon. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yeah. Um, but I still can't quite get the link to the Eucharist as a metaphor for life. Um, uh, I, I know you did explain it, but I still didn't quite get it. Uh, that the blood and, and, and body of Christ, it seems a leap to take that interpretation as that's a metaphor for life. Yes, yeah, but that's, that's exactly the imitation. Yeah, that's exactly the imitation. So why, why, do, why do the Eucharist week after week? You know, there's different layers at which you can enter the mystery of the Eucharist. Yes. So at one layer, it could just be a mechanical thing. And there's nothing wrong with that. I think that's fine. That's perhaps where I think maybe I started. You come to church, it's lovely to be with other people, and something happens when you have bread and wine. But it can just be a religious rite, R-I-T-E, that you just do week by week, a, a ceremony. And that's what, um, you know, I used to, some people may talk about Sunday Christians, you know, and that's the Sunday Christian thing. You do the Eucharist for an hour on a Sunday and then back to the real world on Monday and there's no link between what happened during the Eucharist on Sunday and how you live your life on Monday. I guess I can't put into words, but I've, since I was young, um, have always felt during, the, during communion uh, that I, I feel closer to God. Yes. 
Uh, yes. That's a, my simplistic way of looking at that. Yes, yeah, so it does bring you closer to God, but God has baggage. God, Jesus is like the worst nightmare of an Italian family. So if you, what I mean, that I don't mean to be rude, but if you close, if you date an Italian woman, you don't just date her, isn't it? You date her cousins and her cousins' cousins and her, you know, yep. it, it comes with, and oh. it, it's, the, it's the same with, with Jesus. Jesus comes with baggage. Um, so we're close not only to Jesus in that moment, but we're close to all that Jesus is close to. So the poor, the vulnerable, the uncomfortable, the inconvenient, um, and, and so forth. So if we can see something of Jesus or God or the divine in the Eucharist, gradually that reconditions our consciousness, our paradigm, our way of seeing the world, so that gradually we see everyone that comes our way as Jesus. So that's, that's the reconditioning. And I so then I the closeness that. that you feel to God during the Eucharist, gradually over time, you can experience that same closeness day to day, moment by moment, no matter who you meet. You bump into someone that calls and you have a conversation and that's a Eucharist moment. Why? Because there's something about the divine in you that recognizes the divine in them. And in coming close to them, you've come close to God. Does that make Yes, and uh, the reference to coals uh, makes me uh, jump to my last, uh, last <laughs> question. Coals. <laughs> there was a part in the, in, the, in the sort of summary at the end and the, in the practicality section, and it seemed to me a really long bow, and what you just said seemed to be drawing quite a long bow. Um, whatever we so give, is that a metaphor, a long bow? Yeah, I, I knew you'd understand. Is, is it, it is a long bow, like a, a long bow and arrow, or a long rainbow? Or it, it, It's a metaphor, a <laughs> long bow. What type of bow? A metaphor. A I'm bow not, and arrow? I'm not sure where it comes from. I, I just know <laughs> that it means it's uh, making quite an extreme uh, explanation or reasoning for something that seems to be stretching the truth or credibility out a bit. Oh, okay. All right. That's a new metaphor for <laughs> yeah. me then. Yeah. <laughs> Whatever we give to others will be the body and blood of Christ. Yes. Whatever we receive from others is similarly the body and blood of Christ. Every encounter we have with others within creation is a Eucharistic celebration. Every encounter is thus a sacred reminder. And yes, I can see that if it's an act of kindness, perhaps listening to someone who needs listening, who would be the appropriate thing to keep listening. But an encounter with a lady in coals where you pinch her on the bum <laughs> is not sort of a sacred encounter, I don't think, or when Leslie and I have an argument about me bringing my dirty boots in on the, on the carpet. So I think it's a long bow to say every encounter is a sacred and, and Eucharistic encounter. I think every positive or affirming or kind encounter is. That, that was only my point. So, I mean, I would talk back to that. So um, I think maybe <coughs> part of the spirituality is maybe influenced by someone called um, Ignatius. And he gave us very practical spiritual disciplines to help us in our relationship with God. And what you're describing now reminds me of one of the really special practices that he offered, where we would reflect back on the day. And as we reflect back on the day, we think of moments of consolation. So these are the positive experiences you are talking about. And we are grateful for them and we give thanks to God for them. But then right after that, he makes us think about desolation. So moments where we felt far away from God or far away from others or far away from ourselves or disconnected or disjointed. And he invites us to relive that moment, but somehow relive the moment imagining 
the presence of God in that moment somewhere, whether it's God in the form of Jesus behind you holding you or God in the form of light or love just keeping you safe in that uh, moment because either God is everywhere, yes. you know, or God isn't at all. So God is in those positive moments, but equally God is present in those negative moments too. Otherwise we've lost the capacity for seeing God at all. So God is equally in those negative moments as... And, and because God is part of every encounter or surrounding us or within us or without us mm. in every encounter, that's why you're calling every encounter sacred. Every encounter <laughs> is sacred, even the negative ones. And I know, I know, they've, I know we can look back on our lives and maybe have some grief over some experiences that have marked us and wounded us. And I don't think the Eucharist ignores that. There's that moment in the Eucharist where the bread is taken, and that speaks to me of some things happen against our will or against our design. You just get taken into a moment, almost kidnapped, and then the bread is broken. So it allows for the sacredness, even in the broken moments of our lives. You know, so as the bread is broken, so too are our lives broken, our relationships broken. You know, and, and, and as we meet God in the receiving of the Eucharist, so too do we meet God in those moments of b being broken. So I think that's also captured in the Eucharist. I can see that. I'm not sure the lady who found it most distasteful having a bum pinched in coals would regard that as a sacred moment. Well, if I were her spiritual director and she were offering that to me, you, you know, we would talk through that. So why, why, what is it about that moment? You know, what were the emotions there? Right. And what story do the emotions tell? So if that had happened to me, I'd be angry. So I would give thanks for the emotion of anger, actually, because that comes as a spiritual teacher. It's telling me that there's in, an injustice that needs rectifying, and it's giving me the energy needed to rectify that injustice. Now, how do I want to use this anger? What, what more is it telling me? Well, I, I would feel objectified by that. And the reason I find that offensive is because one of my core values would be that I have immense dignity because there's something of the divine in me and, you know, that person, you know, violating that, that dignity, you know, is what causes the offence. So even just unpacking, unpacking that moment, there's still so much of God to see um, in, that, in that moment, negative experience, though it may be. Okay, thanks. Oh, I had one comment here. I, Quoting the this, you know, the disciples, this teaching is difficult, and I thought uh, I affirm that. <laughs> um, it is the spirit that gives life; the flesh is useless. The words that I have spoken to you are spirit and life. How's that tied up? Yes, yeah, so I remember reading the the commentaries about this, and I, I'm trying to remember what they're saying. I can tell you what they're not saying. So I worry sometimes that we're too Greek in our understanding. So we think maybe there's like a physical flesh part of us and then somehow injected into us is like a spiritual part of us and that the two are separate. So I would, I would suggest that it's happening in a different way. I think the, the, the path of the flesh is the, your whole life or your whole direction moving towards destruction. So in the case of that argument, the, the way of the flesh is being kind of quite autistic and taking the, the symbol literally. So if you're only gonna take the symbol literally, 
it's this path of destruction or death. Um, but if you take the if you take the if you take the metaphor or step into the metaphor, it's the path of life. So it's not one part of us versus another part. It's talking about what direction in life you want to face. A direction of saying the one direction we would say in modern terms is very materialist, very materialist direction. Um, so is it saying that, that the flesh and life are essentially narcissistic and the spirit is what brings out the goodness in us? No, because, because the, the spirit is experienced in the very embrace of the fleshiness of life. I, I, I missed that one. So, so when, when, when I'm inviting people to consider that their whole lives are a Eucharist, I don't think of this as a very head experience or a very philosophical experience or a very sort of airy fairy, wild, spiritual experience separate from life. I'm inviting people to find the spiritual with, within the very messiness of life. So it's not something separate. So the, our, our fleshiness, our our practical lives aren't something separate from the spirit, but they are infused with the spirit. So, for example, you preparing a meal for your family. Now, one way of viewing it is that it's just a meal, but another way of viewing it is it's Eucharist. You're feeding them the body and blood of Christ, and I truly believe that because, because you care for them, there is an infusion of love and grace and compassion that you have for your family that's infused in, into that meal. And I don't know the mechanics or science of this, but I know when I've baked a cake and I haven't felt like doing it, and I've done it with a bad attitude, I can scientifically follow the recipe to the letter, but it will always fail. But on the contrary, if I really want to make the cake and I'm in a in a good space, even if I don't follow the recipe, it comes out well. I don't know if you've, have you ever even baked a cake before we use that analogy? Uh, I have, but it's not a frequent occasion. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but so I, I do think there's, I do think within our day-to-day -day interactions, th th those day-to-day -day interactions are infused uh, with grace and spirit. Okay, thank you. You, don't, you, you understand it, but you don't agree with it? No, no, <laughs> I understand it better than I did before. Oh, okay. <laughs> so the, there's one that's often quoted, no one comes to me unless granted by the Father. And that sort of struck me as, it's always struck me as being at odds with the idea that by God's grace, we're all accepted. Yeah, because um, which part of creation isn't already in God and has always been in God. So the, the analogy I often use is um, one fish comes across another fish and says, you know, I've just heard the strangest thing. There's apparently this thing called water. And the big fish goes, oh yeah, yeah, the water's all around you. In fact, the water's in you. You know, and every time you breathe, it's going through you and your gills, and it's, this is what's giving you life. And then the little fish says, no, but, but I can't see this water. Where, where's this water? You may not be able to see the water, the big fish says, but you've got to trust me on this. The water's there. If the water wasn't there, you wouldn't be. You wouldn't exist. Your whole life is in the water. You eat in the water, you move in the water, the water's just there. And then the fish goes away and thinks, you know, this guy's crazy, you know, it doesn't, what's this thing, water? And it's the same as us. Is there any fish that isn't in water? Is there anyone that's not in the Father? All of creation is in the Father because 
otherwise it wouldn't be. I think at the link, I get the fish story. <laughs> <laughs> no one comes to me unless granted by the father. It sort of sounds like the father's vetting which one's come through to Jesus. That is one, one way of interpreting it, but I don't, I don't believe that's the, the spirit in which it's, it's meant. If we apply it to my metaphor, to the parable, you would, it's basically saying without, without God, without the divine, there is no existence, that, that God is the basis of all reality. So if we apply it to, you know, imagine now we two fish in this ocean. It would be like saying, there isn't a single fish in this entire ocean who isn't in the water, you know, who isn't in the Father. Yeah, Therefore, well, if you're going to have life, only those who are in the Father, only those fish who are in the water are alive, can have I'll life. I have to leave it that I reckon that's a pretty dumb way of saying it. <laughs> <laughs> So uh, we, we can we, we, maybe we, we write that, you know, <laughs> oi, Jesus, you know, <laughs> this doesn't make sense. Let me explain it better. Well, I think we'll John put my fish story in. John didn't remember it very accurately from 100 years before, I reckon. <laughs> Those who eat my flesh and drink my blood abiding me and me in them. Is that a metaphor that those who partake in the Eucharist have a close and rich relationship with God and that those who don't partake in the Eucharist don't? No, no. Um, again, so may I, may I just, um, so part of this is just understanding the, the language that's used to write the original scriptures because the original scriptures are written in Greek. So part of the mindset is infused with this Greek understanding. So may I show you another metaphor? You'll use a metaphor to ask about it. Another right, metaphor. Eh? Yeah, okay. Good. So... I think it will help. So, so ba basically, um, the explanation goes like this. So, a Greek scholar would probably give a better, more nuanced thing, but in summary or shorthand, this is my understanding of, of what it means to be a human being uh, from this standpoint. Okay, so let's take the life of Jesus. So, he's born and um, you know, this is his identity, and he, he thinks of himself, you know, at this level. Um, but as he, uh, as he grows up, he realizes that he's part of a whole cultural movement. So his identity, his answer to the question, who, who, are, who am I, grows. He understands himself as coming from this Jewish tradition and so forth. Um, when he's baptised, there's this breakthrough in consciousness where he experiences, we think it's a mystical experience, that he's related to God in a far deeper way than he ever thought possible. And the language scripture gives to this is the scripture says, this is my beloved son with whom I'm well pleased. So he now sees himself as a beloved child of God. But this is a breakthrough in human consciousness. It's a spiritual evolution for him. And I, it would be at, at this third level. But in that language, you can still see that there's a slight separation between him and God. He's a beloved child of God. But then as he grows and develops further, there is another breakthrough in his spiritual evolution or his consciousness where he says I am in the father and the father is in me which is this final level of reality so I think the gospel of John is, is like a magnet that's pulling us down to this final level of reality where we all understand um, not that we sort of, in our flesh selves, you know, in our individual selves, not only that we're part of a tribe, not only that we are somehow connected or related to God, but this deeper level of reality where we just know like we know that we are in God and that God is 
is in us. And the image or metaphor that people use for this is a thimble in the ocean. You can't get the whole ocean into the thimble, but the thimble immersed in the ocean is abiding in the ocean. So that's what I understand by the meaning of so abide. It's a very deep... So it's not meaning to be exclusive when it says, those who eat my flesh and drink my blood abide in me and me in them. It's not saying that the ones who don't eat my flesh and drink my blood don't abide in me and me and them. It's definitely not being exclusive at mm. all. And again, it's just the power of that metaphor. So as you eat the bread and drink the blood, what happens? Well, it dissolves into your body. So it's actually quite an intimate um, embodied experience having the Eucharist. Yes. And as that bread dissolves into your body, the consciousness is that you are dissolved in God, even as the bread is dissolved in you. Okay. So it's just that extremely deep connection with God. And what the message, I think, of Jesus, when, when people have this stage, this experience of abiding in God, they realize that they've always ab abided in God, that there has never been a moment when they haven't abide, abided, abided in God. So, yeah, and that's, that's, that's the good news, is that your whole existence is one that's embraced by the divine. And there's never been a moment, even the bad moments, where you haven't been totally embraced. So the, the Eucharist, divine. the uh, symbolism of the Eucharist is uh, reinforcing that, uh, that abiding with God and in God. Absolutely, that's exactly right. right. That's the simple way to explain it. The non, what's the opposite of a long bow? A short bow. <laughs> Simple will do. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Thanks, Desiree. Thanks for answering my questions and taking that time. Oh, that were, those were really good <laughs> questions. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs>